Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. Not necessarily in that order. We like to mix it up. And I'm glad that we like to mix it up because we are in the office today of Mr. John Keel, who was one of the leading sound mixers in the country. He is also a composer and he knows a lot about music and advertising. And more than that, he is a ethically conscious being who has a strong interest in civics. And that's what brought us together, really. That's why we're here today. And the person who introduced me to John is Frank Wenin, who is a futurist, a thought leader, a deep intellectual who is also a business visionary. And I actually met Frank uh, on Central Park West when I was premiering my play called How to Be an Actor in Your Own Life, which is a one-man show that I'm working on. It's in development. And this was at a church called the Fourth Universalist Society on Central Park West. But within that church, it was the Church of Humanism, founded by Joseph Ben David, who, was a, who worked with Martin Buber, the great philosopher. So there's a lot of philosophy here that brought us together. And what really made this click is that we are working with Richard Dreyfus, the actor who is also now involved very much in civics and bringing back the teaching of civics. He's been out there giving lectures on it and it's such an inspiring thing for our country to get back to basic civics education. So we're going to have a roundtable dialogue of the kind you've never seen before on TV, I assure you. This is going to be open and spontaneous and authentic and you're going to get to know these two men. Uh, you've known me from being on the show. I'm an educator. Uh, uh, my background is in English education, so my interests have to do with dialogue and storytelling and also the connection between education and democracy. So all of those themes are going to be mixing here, and we're going to pass the microphone over to John Keel, again, one of the leading sound mixers in our country. He's worked on movies uh, for Martin Scorsese. He did the work on Sex in the City, okay, and uh, also the great FDR documentary that aired on PBS last year. That was his work, uh, the music in the background. So, John, welcome to the Public Voice Salon. Well, thanks very much, John. And if... Uh, for all my friends out there who actually did the work uh, on Martin Scorsese's stuff and Ken Burns' stuff, um, my life as a recording engineer uh, faded into my life as just the owner of the facility. So I'm, I'm very proud of, for example, Tommy Fleischman, who won an Academy Award for Hugo for Martin Scorsese. Uh, and I'm very proud of uh, the fact that Ken Burns brought his business here, uh, you know, but I didn't touch any of that work. I'm, I'm the guy, I've always explained soundtrack uh, is the facility, I just make sure the oxygen bottles are full and somebody else is actually in there doing the surgery. So, but I have been a recording engineer, so I've, uh, I've worn all the hats that someone can wear in a recording studio. But soundtrack started as a jingle company actually 40 years ago in Boston and we did jingles for Stop and Shop and uh, Fidelity, uh, the Boston Globe and um, and then I actually we created a music library and one of my songs was actually the theme song to uh, Crossfire I think it was called uh, for for 10 or 15 years so that's my biggest claim to fame. In terms of politics also, Crossfire was a very big show. Yeah it was, big enough that Saturday Night Live used to make fun of it, you know, <laughs> so yeah, I guess you know you've arrived if you're being ridiculed on Saturday Night Live, yeah, but yeah. so, um, but yeah, so I'm still very active uh, helping people produce uh, music, helping people, I now do uh, iPhone apps, I'm, uh, I've um, uh, I've got 14 apps in the App Store, and they all have sort of a spiritual dimension, if you will, you know. Uh, I met Richard Dreyfus because he had a musical toy that he wanted to invent, and, and that's actually how I met him. Uh, another fellow named Luke Dubois, who's over here at NYU's uh, technical campus, the Tandon School of Engineering in Brooklyn. Um, I brought Luke in, and we, we took an idea that Richard had about um, 
sort of the uh, visualization of music. Richard, Richard thinks that because I'm a musician, when I hear a piece of music, I'm hearing more than he's hearing. The truth of it is we can only be hearing the same thing. Does the music mean something more to me because I'm hearing counter melodies or I, I'm sort of hearing the decisions that the arranger or composer, yeah, probably I am. Um, but he, Richard had this, I, this idea of how to maybe turn this into visual information. And he, he thought that if he could see what I'm hearing analytically, that would help him to hear deeper. So that's how we met, and it was only after meeting him that I realized he had this uh, very big interest in American history and this wonderful uh, uh, moment in history that created uh, America. So. And I'm also very interested in the musicality of dialogue and of conversation and how there's like a jazz-like element to the back and forth, um, almost like a dance, also like a dance of conversation. We're trying to educate Americans with our show and also people around the world how to get back into conversation to get off Facebook and get back face to face to relearn the art of of conversation and dialogue it can be so rich doesn't you don't need these expensive sets you know when you see these studios uh, with with talking heads and all just people coming together to talk and share and through the discourse uh, come up with new ideas and new visions and certainly we do need to save our our world right now we need to save our planet it's not exaggeration most scientists do say that that we have global warming and it's real it's not it's not a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese it is real and we have threats to our democracy as well with big money and big money controlling the political process, big money controlling the media, and big money controlling the culture as well and dumbing down the culture and creating, like we talked earlier about, too many violent shows. So we're trying to move toward peace and love and a more caring world. And with that, I'll pass it over to Frank, my dear friend Frank, who's such a wonderful human being and kind, and, and John too. These are two wonderful, beautiful men who have things to say, who ought to, I always say get on the big shows you know but maybe we need to transform the big shows and to show these kind of visionary ideas so uh, Frank civics business your mindset give give the world an introduction to yourself and and some of your outside the box thoughts you're like the modern-day Buckminster Fuller here you go thank you for the compliment uh, John um, John and I uh, John Keel and I met um, about four years ago at a, a TEDx salon where we, we would go to a, a weekly TED talk and um, we would be like 50 New Yorkers having a, a, an amazing conversation after, um, after watching a TED talk. And I, I recognized John had a lot to bring to the table and that we, we became friends. And, and at some point um, we started trying to do projects and, and put different things together to transform the economy to to, to wake people up, we agreed on the baseline of how do we have a healthy relationship with ourselves? Um, how do we come up with better language? Um, in order to, cre to create lasting change, we must, uh, in order to change the future, no, we must change the story. In order, no, in order, to, in order to make history, we must change the story. So in, in order for that to happen, we must come up with better language. And, and thank you, that's it. So, so, um, so um, he told me about his relationship with Richard Dreyfus, and it turns out that I had a, a friend from high school who was um, was a high school principal, and I was going to get he, the four of us and Richard together, and then he you had a cousin, and then his employee had had a teacher, and then the, the right the community grew overnight, and then Richard was on a conversation, and we kept it going, and and then you you had a salon. Uh, um, how to be an actor in your own life. And you had this amazing uh, group of people and, and this conversation, and y your intro was so long, we never quite got to the colla <laughs> collaboration of um, how, how, do we be, how do we have a better relationship with ourselves? How do we be an actor? Because we're, we're all playwrights in the, in the casting of our, or what, we're all casting directors in the play of our own life. Or something like that. I mean, I'm open to the better language and how that shows up. But we're um, so so. I'm open to a larger collaborative dialogue. Uh, when, you know, when enough people, because um, we become the people that we surround ourselves with. 
So, so when we identify the people that bring out the best in us and the people that we bring out the best in, right. we can make those natural adjustments on the who we are, what we are, why we are. And, and so that, to, to me, the value of that, of that transformation is greater than money as we know it. And that when we can start to really harness that change and transformation, because we can only speak to transformation to the extent that we know who we have to be to transform our own lives. So to the extent that we know who we are, who we have to be to be those people, then no one can take that away from us. So we'll start there. Wonderful. Thank you. should be really on a lecture tour out there getting these you know, ideas around the country. You should be out there like Mark Twain and, and Charles Dickens and you know, on the stump, you know, putting these ideas out into the public space. And uh, let's, let's make a little transformation in our own lives and when people go, wow, how did you do that? And then you get invited and then it grows, essentially. That's and as I always turn toward the audience and say this is a pedagogical show, we want to liberate the people on the couch watching right now to get off the couch when the show is over, you know, and, and to take action and be involved in your communities and to uh, do what you can to take our country back, our democracy back. I, I, I had a little foray into the business world a few years ago where I became a real estate agent and I didn't really cotton to it because there was this kind of a superficiality and a selfishness. The only reason I did it was because they they don't pay adjunct professors much in our country, which is a crime. It's really a crime. Adjunct professors now have 75% of the teaching load in the country. So that means for the typical adjunct professor, uh, they have to teach five or six classes. They're on a treadmill, and they really can't do the kind of reading and writing and scholarship that would allow them to be good teachers in the classroom. So who gets short shifted is the student. And that's a very big problem. I've been lucky because I have always been able to find friends and, and women and my, my lovely wife Claudia who supports us and now I'm escaping academia with this TV show. So this TV show is really a media intervention by a teacher who got frustrated with administration, with the corporatization of academia. They're pushing a business model on, ac on people so people are not studying philosophy, they're not studying the humanities, they're not studying literature. They're getting this uh, kind of, you know, how to be a, a marketer and make tons of money and, and screw everybody and make my profits and, and that's it. So when I did my brief intervention into corporate America, I was appalled at the shallow the selfishness. So I began to write books on that and I wrote a series of ethical business uh, texts which sold absolutely nothing. Um, I wrote a book called The Ethical Sales Agent and if I had a dime for everybody who told me that's an oxymoron I'd be rich because they said you can't be ethical in, in sales, right? And I used to say well that's why you got to read my book and so it hasn't really taken off yet but I also created an organization called The Ethical Business Society which lasted for three years and it was a gathering in cafes uh, and basically in downtown New York where people would talk about the problems in corporate America and how to solve them and how to move towards a triple P bottom line. People, planet, profits. Not just profits, but people, planet, profits. So that was my little foray into business. And one phrase that came out of that for me was that I think I came up with this is that money needs to flow to the good people for a change. Money is flowing all to these top 1% hedge fund people, all the finance, which money making money, which is kind of useless and fictional, when all the folks who are doing meaningful work, who are trying to change the world and save the world, are running around broke. That's not fair, you know. And which also connects to what I call a new theory of fame. My last book is called A New Theory of Fame. A lot of the wrong people are famous, folks. I think you're starting to realize that. Kim Kardashian, people like that, who people who go into politics, whatever, that are famous, and then they, you know, that, that what, what, what did they really do that makes them more worthy of recognition than a good scientist, or a good teacher, or a good activist, or sound mixer, or someone who's an artist, who's not a corporate sponsored artist, but an authentic artist. So those are just some, things to share, to put into the pot, the mix of dialogue here. John's a sound mixer, I'm a mixer of, of dialogue and ideas, and now I'll pass the microphone over to John and, and talk a little bit about, maybe you can go into more detail about how uh, you plan to work with Richard Dreyfus in the civics initiative. Well, um, um, for example, um, Richard has this lovely idea of, of asking people to look at the preamble of the Constitution 
we the people in order to form a more perfect union, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I say blah, 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 just because I don't know the rest of the preamble. But um, um, his idea is to ask people, do you still, in the 21st century, believe these words? And if you do, would you please sign the preamble and send it in to his website. He's got a website called the Dreyfus Initiative. And so um, I've already created uh, an app that would allow somebody to sign their name to the preamble. And I'm learning how to now collect. Uh, it's going to be a few more months while I figure out Amazon Web Services and some other big data issues. Uh, but um, we should be collecting citizens of America who still believe that we, the people, uh, are trying to form a more perfect union. And, and so, this is right, Richard's thing is very nonpartisan. Good. It's, it's about finding, Good ideas. it's about finding the middle of the road. Um, there's another gentleman I adore named Don Beck down in Dallas, Texas. Don, Don's uh, framework is called Spiral Dynamics. And he speaks very beautifully to when a system is under strain, everybody retreats to a simpler position. He loves to ask someone to stand up and ask them to jump up in the air. And of course, the first thing they do is they crouch down and then jump up. And he says, so what did you do to jump up in the air? You retreated to a simpler position. So we're in America right now, we've all retreated to these corners that we can sort of defend you know, simply, and we've vacated the middle. So somehow we've got to create a safe space for ourselves, you know, in the middle, that we can come out of our corners and sort of uh, trust that, that we can uh, navigate a, a, a sort of a, a less austere perspective, that we can entertain the other person's idea. Uh, again, Don would say, you retreat into your corner and then everybody who's not with you in that corner is against you. So even the people that are out there in the middle being brave, you know, you see them as being opponents to you. Uh, and, and this, this you, you just go right down, the tea party, the blah, 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 the blah, 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 the blah, blah, blah. Everybody's retreated in, into their corner and their issue. So. There's such a need for dialogue, for basic conversation. Uh, John Dewey, uh, who, you know, John, you're a big fan of Dewey. You're the first person I've met, and I don't know how many years, who actually reads John Dewey. So, and to have a, you know, someone who works in this, in this corporate field, albeit the creative side of corporate America, to be a fan of John Dewey, that's a rarity. That's a rarity. And, and John Dewey, I was just reading him the other day, talked about the need for an articulate public, right? Not, not just to have pontificating punditry, but to have an articulate public of people who could find their voices and struggle. And Dewey also talked about the importance of naming obstacles, that if you can't name the problem, you can't solve the problem. And, 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 and the idea of seeing these problems as solvable, that actuality, you know, is what, what, what they tell us what is, there's a, there's a difference between what is and what might be and what could be. And for that, we need more visionary thinking. You know, I just read Thomas More's Utopia, a book I've never read, and that's where we get the word utopia. And obviously, utopia as a concept is problematic, but there are some good things we can tease out of that as well. And he talked about this uh, questioning of, of land ownership. And, you know, obviously, we need a more equitable distribution of wealth in our country. That's a big, big thing. Um, and, but this is a delightful space to be, a very aesthetic space. We're going to spend a little more time here at the table. Then we're going to actually call Richard Dreyfus. We're going to see if we can get him on the phone. I was able to get him yesterday, which was incredible, because I know he just did Einstein. He played Albert Einstein on a one-man show in Connecticut. And shame that they didn't pick it up on Broadway, because that, that's what we need more of that kind of theater. But then he went to uh, Italy, and he was there for a while. I wasn't sure if he was back in the U.S. I figured I'd give it a try yesterday. He was in San Diego, so we could see if we can get them on the phone just spo spontaneously. But uh, but I want to look around this office too and look at some of these wonderful artifacts. It's such a beautiful space to be in. And um, But Frank, I want to hand the microphone to you. Something you say, which I think is very important, you talk about how the um, immediate family 
is healed by the extended, the extended family. And that idea of a, of a community of, of strangers, of, of bringing people into the mix. You know, Robert Putnam, whose work I reference a lot on this show, he wrote a, a book called Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community. And says he says that the mental health of a community is dependent by not how many friends you have, but how many brief chats you can have with a stranger on the sidewalk. You know, and those cafe, when you see someone at, at a cafe for the second time and decide to say hello or not, we're, kind of, we're, we're losing that. And you have all the uh, laptop jockeys in the cafes and, and no real conversation. So talk a little bit more about that, uh, healing the, 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 the nuclear family. Yeah. So we, we all, most of us, um, grow up in some sort of a broken family. And, family. And, and, right, and instead of like pointing blame and say, yeah. We, you know, at some point we, we can't um, blame our parents yeah. because their parents didn't know how to reach them. At some point it's our responsibility to identify who has a good relationship with themselves, for who is time and money their servants and not their masters, for, um, you know, who, who walks their spiritual talk, who... Um, you know, who is a natural example of integrity in action. At some point, once we identify physically, financially, socially, spiritually, intellectually, family, community, all the good goal setting, realize your full capabilities programs, because I don't say potential anymore, because when will we know when we've ever reached mm. our full potential? But there's only so many friends, people, mm. resources, deadlines mm. that we can have before. Oh, sir? Closer. There's only there's only so many friends, people, resources, deadlines, commitments that we can have in our life before our cup overfloweth. Once we know what that is for ourselves and our friends and our family and our community, then no one can take that away from us. So at some point, it's our responsibility to identify the extended family that heals the immediate family. And once we've made those integrations in our own lives, then we can help other people down the path. This conversation could go on for hours, and this is the kind of dialogues that I want to have more of on this show, and to bring more people into the room. That's something I learned from you, Frank. You always say, like, who else should be part of this conversation, right? And um, obviously when Richard... Seven or, eight people is what activates a crit seven or eight people is what activates a critical mass. Think of it like batteries to fuel the, the thing. That, that, that are cells to, to fuel the batteries. To, so so we, when we have seven people, or ideally four couples, to, you know, if, if, if you and your wife are, uh, are an unstoppable force unto yourself, then identify the other three or four couples that are also unstoppable forces unto themselves. And you would, you would be your own jetpack, so to speak. Wow. Uh, um, the Jetsons. Something, something like that, yeah. And, and, and so we could actually change the world and save the world with these small groups. Yeah, that is true. I, I hear more and more about that. I was reading Parker Palmer's book, Healing the Heart of Democracy, where he says the importance of like a small group of people, four or five people being in community, that that's how you stay strong with your own mission and your own politics by, you know, because if you're, if you're sort of visionary, and everybody's telling you, oh, that's not going to work. You're not going to do that. If you're constantly with people who are naysayers, then you can give up your, your spark, your, you know, your innovativeness. So it's important that people who are cutting edge find each other in these kind of circles, you know, small circles. And uh, so, yeah. When more people lead, the leaders will follow. Um, I remember Queen, Queen Latifah, when she was younger, you used to say that she she would only surround herself with people that were were doing things, that were making things happen, doing things, and anybody that wasn't, she would cut off. And, and she grew up in Newark, New Jersey. She did, and and uh, you know, and and we can use her as a local example of somebody who's yeah. still around, still doing amazing work, and that um, probably somebody we have access to through our friend of a friend, but you know, that's another conversation. Another conversation. I've also told my students when I taught in Newark, New Jersey at Essex County College that very often growing has to do with making new friends, finding a new community. And if somebody's bringing you down, you, sometimes you really do have to cut loose from, from that person or those people. As you grow and move forward, if other people are not growing and moving forward, then you find new friends. And that's where I feel like finding you two guys was, was like that for me, you know. And uh, John, you're just so intellectually curious and, and you're wonderful to talk to. 
on the phone, even in those wonderful group dialogues we had with Richard Dreyfus over the summer, which were just basically phone conferences where we didn't see the person, we just heard the voices. The voices would pop in and it was like these sort of dancing in outer space with the voices and the consciousness and having these dialogues. But that kept me strong over the summer. You know, at a time when our politics is getting out of control in our country, I think we need to find each other. There was a women's march uh, a week ago, two weeks ago, the big women's march, the biggest protest march in the history of humanity, I think. So people are coming together, they're finding each other. And um, so, uh, Claudia, what is the time? How are we doing on time, sweetie? Because I wanted to also. All right, so. I would like to walk around the studio if we could a little sure. bit, John, yeah, and just sort of point out things that are interesting and then get your commentary on them. Sure. Uh, easily done. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's okay. Do it. Look at this cool radio. I love this radio, man. What, what year is this and what's the story? I'm not going to know what year this was. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you're, you're not quite as old as I am, but right. this certainly would be the kind of radio that any family in America would have in the uh, 1950s, right? Uh, um, yes, yes, yes. This this radio actually has middle short class, uh, middle, middle class. class totally. This I mean, this is what you had. You had a you had a television that had an ABC channel, an NBC channel, a CBS channel, and a public tele, and that was it, uh, right? Uh, and all of America was watching the same shows every night, uh, right? And it was a very cohesive, you know. Uh, uh, thing and in a way that gave us that yes. community that you were talking about because we were we all were listening to the same voices and and the, and those voices hadn't gotten quite so hadn't sold out quite right. the yeah, way. FDR fireside chats right but you you had you know uh, yeah. you had all those marvelous men and women who were our anchor people right yes. but yes. Uh, when it came to radio, uh, this is what you had. I mean, I remember as a teenager when FM uh -huh. sort of came along. Like FM didn't even exist when I was a little kid. Uh, Could you listen to FM radio? Sure. Some of your favorite uh, music was? Uh, uh. <laughs> Led Zeppelin, you were Led Zeppelin? Led Zeppelin, Rush, Boston, you were saying. Uh, uh, um, then later on, Steely Dan. and. I had a Led Zeppelin album that I played over and over again, Physical Graffiti, yeah. yeah. But you like more kind of... But I'm talking about in the 50s. I'm talking like 1958, 1956, 1962. You, you weren't listening to Led Zeppelin in 1962. Oh, I mean, it was Buddy Holly, right? And what, what, what was FM back then? FM, FM was exclusively classical music. Because uh, uh -huh. it, that's all you could find on FM. WPXR, I think, was one of the original, right? Okay, let's anyway, move on. Were you an Elvis fan, by the way? Elvis? I was not an Elvis. Again, I was a soul man. I was a trombone player in, in growing up. And one day I was in, in 10th grade, I was in band class. And the saxophonist came up to me and said, hey, John, you, I'm, going to a, I'm going to a band rehearsal tonight. Would you, you want to come join the audition for the band? And I'm saying to myself, what kind of band would have a trombone player in it, right? And he said, well, it's a soul band. Right. And I said, what's a soul band, you know? And he says, they play soul music. I said, what is soul music, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so uh, I, I know, so, well, again, this is 1966, right? So I go to this rehearsal. And I'm hearing artists that essentially I'm hearing for the first time, like Sam and Dave, like Aretha Franklin, like uh, Jerry Butler, the Iceman, right? And I'm, and I'm playing horn parts for a kind of music that I had never heard before. And all of a sudden, because now there was a place for me in pop culture, I became a soul man, you know, and so I went through, uh, I, actually I grew up in Ferguson, Missouri, and I was often, our band of white kids, we were often the only white people in the club because this was the phenomenon in St. Louis. You grew up where that big protest was last year, right, Ferguson? That's Ferguson, Missouri. Wow. Yeah, and uh, when, when, I w when I was there, uh, when I was there, uh, there was a, a great part of St. Louis that loved uh, soul culture. And so I, was, I, I got pulled into that. And so uh, we were playing soul music, and, and it was, there were many, many bands in St. Louis 
who uh, were basically white kids who loved soul music. And sometimes we'd have, uh, these groups would have a black performer or black front, you know, two or three men or women singing. But the band was all us white kids who were falling in love with soul music. And that's, so that's my, wow. that's my background, so to speak. Okay. Now, we're not going to talk too much more in this spot because I just want, first of all, Claudia is holding the camera and we're a low budget operation and this is, we don't want her to carry it for too long. So just a quick swing around. I love this office. When I come in here, I get happy just to be, this is an aesthetic wonderland. Look at, just pan around, baby. Look at this. We got some more old radios here. And I like that uh, kind of megaphone that's very patriotic. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to bring patriotism and civics to our country through some kind of communication process. Look at that. That's a metaphor for everything we're trying to do, I think. Right there. Right. Wow. Um, and if we keep walking. Uh, and over here, look, look, look. Who's that, Liberace? This is actually, this is my partner's father, okay. who was uh, very celebrated in Boston oh, as a musician, right. uh, uh, Salvi Cavicchio. And uh, I got very lucky in meeting a man my partner's five years older than me. So when I was turning my sights into the music business, yeah. I met this man who had a lifetime of, as he would say, watching my father right. struggle in the arts. Okay. And he said, it's not the smartest decision a yes. young person can make. Yes. And it was sort of his vision uh -huh. to figure out how do we get control of our artistic lives right. you know, with some sort of business. And it was his vision that we should be musicians, but we should also have a recording studio. And so the studio has sort of uh. given us a, a more of a business grounding than a typical career of a composer or yeah. songwriter who yeah. sort of never knows when the phone's going to ring. Oh, there's Girls, Sw Switch Show Girls. That was a famous TV right. show all that, these, the, yeah. All these music posters, uh, movie posters, uh -huh. mean that we had something to do with the making of that, the audio part of that okay. film or that okay. TV show. Yeah. Very, very cool. And over here, look at this sign. I love this old image. Yeah. Drink Moxie, good at any temperature. Right. I think Moxie was kind Moxie. of, a, 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 I think it was basically a southern drink. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but someone once said that who saw the poster, you know. Let me look in the camera now and say something very important. Progressives, you got to get some moxie. You got no moxie. You need moxie if you're going to win, if we're going to save the world. Planet savers, listen to me. Moxie. Follow, follow me, okay? The other side has too much moxie. Let's look over here. Oh, look at this bunny. I love this. What is this old advertisement? What year is this? You know, again, I, I remember Bunny Bread as a child. Come on this side, John. Uh, yeah, I remember. Over. You remember Bunny Bread as a child? Sure. Frank, do you remember Bunny Bread? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't grow up in Missouri. Show so. Okay. Well, uh, everyone remembers Wonder Bread, right? right, right. Yeah. So. Uh, but I, I would think was was uh, are Bunny and Wonder the same company? Or? I don't think they're the same company. No, but it's that same. America was learning how to be consumer oriented, right? Isn't that sort of what the 20th century is about? Yeah. You know, is America learning yes. how how to brand something and that how how you uh -huh. make a brand and how you uh, grow a brand and service a brand. Uh, Would Chomsky call that propaganda? Well, it's you know it. There's uh, there's a dark there's a dark lining to every cloud, okay. right? So uh, we we're, we're living now in the dark side of branding, right? Yes. And I was I was really disheartened. I was watching something the other day on television. It was either about politics or education or something. And you would have swear they were talking about mm. a, a product like this that sits on the shelf. And because, oh. because the business language has right. won the day and everything's a brand. It's terrible. It's brand awful. Brand it's and really bad. It is awful. The word brand should be banned, I think. Well, I think the minute, the, minute you start, the minute you start trying to elevate yeah. the business world into these higher realms of our Horrible, horrible. You, you, that's the first clue that you're doing something really wrong. Right. Right. Are you a fan of 7-Up, Frank? We got you next to the 7-Up sign. It's the healthier of the choices, isn't it? <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> well. I remember John and I have had many conversations along this line okay. that human, humanity's consciousness hasn't really risen much above the belly button. 
Let's it, get it above the belly button, folks. We're trying to do that with our show, and if that's right. right. Yeah. So, so, so like, like we're saying, how do we have a healthy relationship with ourselves? How do we create a whole systems learning environment? What does it mean for two people to be an unstoppable force? Okay. At what point do we have enough friends in our life, and that we know uh, exactly uh, uh, yes. who we have to be to have fulfilling lives and help enough other people have fulfilling lives that? Other people are, are we're, we have too many friends that we have to be generous and we have to pass it along. There is such a thing as too many friends. Most people don't know what that is, but I promise you, yes. there are only so many people that you can keep your word to before. It's called Facebook. Um, well, th that's a place to. But how many of those you, people you should are really be, friends? You should be at Carnegie Hall giving this talk. I appreciate that. But I want to say one more thing, just to get humanity above the belly button. Why don't we call Richard Dreyfus? Maybe okay. that would be helpful. So Let's go into that fancy room, that wonderful okay. room. What do you call that room? Well, it's just Studio J. So we'll, okay. we'll go down to Studio J and make the call. Let's you know. do it. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> so now we're live in Studio J. This is where the action is here uh, at John Keel Soundtrack Studio uh, in the Flatiron District of New York. You got the Flatiron Building. You, you don't get any more Gotham than this neighborhood right here. It's really uh, a treat to come in here uh, and spend some time uh, with you two men. And uh, as we begin this civic dialogue, which I really want this to be a series ongoing. I want this to be the first, uh, especially connection with uh, Richard Dreyfus and what he's doing. Um, last night I went to a meeting of the Westview News newspaper, which is on Charles Street in the village, and I begin writing for the paper, and we have a monthly meeting, and I mentioned uh, this civics project that we're doing with Richard, and the owner of this home where the writer Sinclair Lewis once lived in this home. It's a beautiful home, Brownstone on Charles Street. He said, um, would Richard like to come here? And I said, well, we'll ask him, you know, maybe he will. And I think if we could get him there or if, if he doesn't want to come, we could give a presentation to begin sort of touring this through the living rooms of America. I think to have living room salons also would be a good thing and to film them and to put them out there. When Occupy Wall Street was at its height and the police then cracked down on them, uh, I always thought, why don't these folks just continue to gather in people's homes and film it and put it out on YouTube? And so I think, I think when a society becomes more totalitarian, one uh, strategy is to go a little bit underground in terms of filming. Obviously, we need to take the media back. We need very big money to have a station like you're watching us now, and we're getting about 17 viewers now. I'm only kidding. There's more than that, maybe a couple thousand in New York. And we're also airing in Hoboken, New Jersey, where Claudia and I live. We, we like to air the show in the town where we live so we can get the face-to-face -face on the street, you know, reaction that this is a community. But it's also going around the world on the Internet. Now, once we get proper funding, we can go out to more people. But obviously, this is beginning a process of teaching America how to talk teaching America how to think, how to think uh, politically, civically, culturally, to come back together, to be in community, to learn the connection between identity and being in a community as well. I think that's very important. So that being said, look at this beautiful studio we're in. Claudia, maybe you could show the council here, the uh, console. I said council, no, console, this is this is where it happens. This is like Star Trek, man. This is like the, uh, uh, what do you call that uh, room in Star Trek? The, uh, the, bridge. the bridge. We're on the bridge in Star Trek here, baby. And um, I'm going to pass the microphone over to John, and you could continue in the dialogue. Uh, just to... The uh, our whole industry is computer based. I, obviously, I started when we were still recording on tape, and you would cut with a razor blade and uh, tape things back together. But now, of course, everything is digital and in the computer, um, and that also contributed to the demise of my industry. Is that the technology became more and more accessible to everybody. There's nothing in this room that you can't get for your Apple computer laptop. Uh, and quite honestly, a lot of work, even on these big films that we get done, that we do, are being done on laptops as people commute into work, <laughs> you know, so, uh, but 
uh, you know, I wanted to mention there is an initiative coming out of Washington, D.C. called Living Room Conversations. I just heard about this up Good. at, I was up at Yale last week oh. at a uh, tea in the afternoon. Oh. And high tea, um, high tea at Yale at four <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon in one of their living groups, yeah. and um, so in fact, the idea is catching on. Um, it also reminds me uh, years ago there was a show I loved called The Genesis Experiment or something like that, and Robert Bly, not Robert Bly, but. Um, he was the poetry guy, Robert. Robert Bly. Bly is the poetry guy, and, and I confuse him all the time with uh, Bill Moyers. Right, well, because they're two of them. Going exactly. So uh, Bill Moyers had gotten wind of uh, a moral discussion that was happening weekly in New York City, specifically for businessmen. And it was ba it was a student of Kohlberg's from Harvard named um, Robert, uh, Rabbi Vitsotsky, mm -hmm. uh, who's, I believe he's up here at Jewish uh, Theological Seminary still. Um, and Rabbi Vitsotsky uh, created this uh, evening for CEOs where you would read a, a chapter from the Old Testament. Uh, let's say uh, the giving of Sarah to the, uh, to the Pharaoh. You know, Abraham gives away his wife to the Pharaoh upon going to Egypt, if I've got the story right. Uh, and uh, so what are the moral implications? What's going on there in that story? Because Kohlberg mm -hmm. had learned that you don't have to live through moral uh, quandaries. You can talk your way through a heightened moral uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. And that just by talking through moral things morally, you improve as a moral human being. So that was the premise uh, of the show in the late 80s. And I, th I think we can start encouraging Americans to gather together in their living rooms and with a small group of people and and f yeah. learning learning how to talk to each, each each other civilly you know you can start tonight folks watching us you can turn to the person next to you on the couch or you can walk to your local cafe and talk to a stranger but to begin this process it's so important it really is um and um yeah if there's any moral business people watching we want you to be part of the dialogue, you know. I also wrote a book called Spy in the House of Capitalism. It was sort of a provocative title, and uh, we're looking for someone to do the movie rights on that. If, uh, you know, maybe you know somebody. Spy in the House of Capitalism. Um, let's take a look at that wall of fame there. Uh, you're a very humble person, uh, John, but these are some of the uh, awards that were won by your company. One of them is the movie August Osage County. That was a very, very big play on Broadway, and then it was an important film. Then there's The Broadwalk Empire. That was a huge hit on HBO. And this is, this is your work. Yes. Um, now this, we're sitting in the room mm -hmm. of a fellow who, who coined the phrase permalance. Oh. Uh, he's freelance, but he's permanent. Given his druthers, he'll, he'll work here. And so he's permanently placed here. And uh, these are all the projects that he's touched. Uh, and we've done all of Martin Scorsese's work, for example, since 2005. Wow. And that, that's a gentleman named Tommy Fleischman. Um, some of those movies, just throw a few. Well, yeah. so, uh, you know, Shelter Island, The Aviator, The Wolf of Wall Street, oh, uh, ah. um, you know, Hugo, uh, the, the one that's out now called Silence. Um, um, and, and so this gentleman, Mark D. Simone, uh, uh, a big project like that requires a lot of people to be working on it. And so Mark's kind of known specifically for what's called uh, ADR, mm. Automatic Dialogue Replacement. And so actors will come in here, they'll watch themselves, you know, having been shot. Mm -hmm. Now that the movie is sort of done, they realize that some of the audio is not quite up to snuff. And so the, mm -hmm. they, the actors, the poor actors, have to come back here okay. and mimic what they did. <laughs> uh, they hate doing it, 
because from their point of view, uh, it's they did it already. It's done. How comes the sound team couldn't didn't capture the sound? You know, but uh, sound is a, is a sort of a second class citizen in a motion picture. We only represent about 10 percent of the budget, and so you're not going to sacrifice a take because the sound wasn't right. If the, if, the, if, the, if the acting was great and the picture was great and the lighting was great, you know, right, right. We, can always, we can always fix the sound later, well, you know, so. Well, just to kind of piece this all together, it's kind of a metaphor even for politics and democracy that you're always working on it. You're always perfecting it. You always have to show up. And like any good work of art, or a musical composition, everybody puts their little piece in, you know, and then it's kind of a, we're all a piece of the puzzle, you know, in a, in a community, in an authentic community, in a democracy. So there are interlinkages. And also to show, we're so glad we have you on, John, to show a business person, a creative person who also, you're involved in the arts, you're involved in business, but you're also involved in a civic capacity to try to make a better world, a more kind, caring, fair, just world. You mentioned The Wolf of Wall Street. That's a good movie to see the opposite end of the spectrum because that's a film that shows you the evil that corrupts in terms of when you're only going after money and how horrible that is and the darkness of that world which has become so prevalent in our society now so you know a work of art can also uh, show you the problem that needs to be repaired and that's what John Dewey talked a lot about that you know if we're trying to make a better world well works of art you, you can uh, shows you the uh, what needs to be fixed in other words yes yes but I want to bring uh, our friend Frank into the conversation and say how is it going? Now, you brought Richard Dreyfus. You were one of the key linkages to keep this whole group going with Richard Dreyfus. So I'm going to let you call Richard, if that's okay. Would you like to reach out and see if we can get him? I mean, he's... Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. There you go. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's his cell number there. He's in San Diego, oh, I think. Do you okay. hear Frank, and we'll hear him. Uh, yeah, let's see if we could hear him. Yeah. Where is okay. the... Hang on. Speaker. Okay. Not hit nine. Okay. The power of technology. <laughs> this is Richard. Please leave a message and a number. I'll call you back. <laughs> the mailbox is full and cannot accept any messages at this time. Goodbye. Well, he's a popular guy <laughs> these sure. days. He's been out of town a long time, I think. Right. Um, who's that person? Did so, let's see if let's he see. Richard. Yeah. It's John and Frank and John, John Keel. Keel. <laughs> hey. hey. Richard, you're on TV. We're filming this right now. <laughs> you are. Huh? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, I so, want that part of that technology. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're like on the Starship Enterprise here at John Keel's office with all the equipment around us. You're on TV. This show is going to air. So give us a quick update on what's going on with the Civics Project, if you may, or if you'd like to. I was supposed to be in New York at this time, and then I got pneumonia, and I decided that it would be the height of folly to march into a blizzard with pneumonia. So I brought George McDonald out here, and he and I are working every day on the book. And that's what I'm concentrating on, and George. And I didn't, I forgot to tell George when I, when I spoke to, uh, spoke to you yesterday, John, that I had spoken to you and that you wanted to add to the book. <laughs> Richard, something magical happened yesterday uh, when I called you. This is John Braden. I, I've been thinking about you because I was... Over breakfast, I was watching the news, and I was getting bored with the news, and I decided to turn on Turner Classic Movies, and guess what was on? Mm -hmm. The Goodbye Girl. And there you were, up on the roof with this magical scene, dancing with Marsha Mason, uh, and then you were on Charles Street in this experimental theater, and you got discovered for Hollywood. And I said, "Oh my goodness, I got I got to call Richard Dreyfus <laughs> and tune in back in with the Civics Project. We need to save our democracy and save our planet, sir. And you are one of the key people on this." Well, uh, I totally. 
totally agree. <laughs> I, I totally agree that I am that important. Uh, uh, and he, and yeah, here's John Keel. He's going to say a few things. Yeah. Richard, I was thinking of you the other day. I was up at Yale and ran into an initiative coming out of Washington, D.C. called Living Room Conversations. Um, and it's... Uh, it's something about getting people to come together, you know, in small groups and and have these conversations that you yearn for, uh, America. I'd, I'd love to get you introduced to them because um, um, my sense is people need to, to uh, sort of be tutored a bit of how to talk civically. I think we, we have forgotten how to do that. We haven't seen it done in a long time. And, uh, you know, maybe we can help you or maybe you can help all of us learn how to do that again. I'm going to try to put you on uh, speakerphone so that George can hear what you're saying. Hold up. I'm going to throw us on speaker on this end. Okay. All right. Here's Richard. Hey, um, so, George, I was just telling Richard of an initiative I heard about coming out of, I believe, the Washington, D.C. area called Living Room Conversations. And I heard about it up at um, Yale University. So it might be something that's grabbing a hold of our college campuses of encouraging these young people to get together uh, in small groups and, and start having these civic uh, discussions. Um, uh, let me catch you up on one thing, and if I'm repeating myself, just just interrupt and tell me you've heard it all. Okay. A year ago, the initiative was given a peer review in an educational journal, and it came off with good marks, and... Um, then one of the professors down at Texas A&M who had done this took the idea of the civic clubs and which is always meant to be off campus and not for credit. Uh, he did it on campus, but with volunteers, uh, at the noon hour. And what I was told was that was that the um, stats for bullying fell precipitously and the stats for civil discussion rose. Uh, they didn't do it for very long, but they did it and they are, in, in a sense, what they were doing was a stand-in for what you're talking about. When I hear that the government is trying to foster uh, discussions in small groups, my antenna goes up because uh, the government is really not meant to be the, the sponsor or endorser of anything. Well, and Richard, Certainly. I didn't mean it that literally that this was Washington and hence government. I meant it was coming out of some civic group or some university in the Washington, D.C. area. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I would like to do is talk to those people and see if we can combine or marry the two ideas because my civic clubs are all voluntary. They're all held in parks. And they're all run by, not necessarily teachers, but anybody who has uh, a grounding in American history and knows how to control a group of people talking about anything. Yeah. Um, I, I did it because I remembered that in the past, America had a hobby of talking about itself. And it was America's favorite hobby. Um, and I think that uh, if we could recreate that, it would be of enormous uh, help and, and it would be enormous fun. Not for credit, not for nothing, except for the fun itself. Okay. Uh, 
Pretty All good. right. Thank you so much, Richard. We love you. We're so happy to be doing this with you, and uh, we look forward to our next conversation with you. Okay, great. Okay. Nice to hear from all of you. Okay, great. Richard. Take care, my friend. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, this has been such a pleasure and a treat uh, to be with both you men, my friends, and uh, as we continue to work on the civics project and try to get it out there in the world, you know, to try to build on this uh, victory here today that we had with this dialogue and that we had uh, Richard Dreif as a part of the conversation. So these are just some final moments to reflect on the work we did today and what your thoughts are on it. Well, um I don't want to say it's this simple, but it's this simple, right? It's sort of just making a commitment, finding the time, uh, people getting together, uh, and uh, thinking through this stuff. So. And again, when I say work, this is work. This is not propaganda media. This is citizens coming together to talk and uh, about the problems in the world and also to have a good time and to laugh and enjoy life and talk about our work, our art, and, and stuff like that. I have a, a program I've developed called Chess Outside the Box, and in summary, there's seven points. No one's better than anyone. None of us is as wise as all of us. Until we all learn how to win together, we lose. Ask better questions, solve better problems, make better choices, tell better stories, unleash the hidden treasures within us all. Thank you. The other thing that you say that I love, uh, Frank, is that uh, just with a few conversations, we could really get a lot of work done. There are people who know people who you need to connect with, and then if you get in sync and your consciousness, you know, you have that kind of mixture and the chemistry of your minds are working together. And that the right people are involved, no one wants to miss out. Right. So it is about being in community. It's about uh, turning off the TV when it's corporate media and being together and, and, and being hopeful. Because without hope, it's very hard to do any kind of work. So uh, knowing that you're not alone is a good thing. And um, you guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this dialogue so much. And I'm going to enjoy the conversation when it continues, when the camera goes off, because it's fun to talk to these guys. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Oh, 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 thank you to my darling wife, Claudia, who is from Bogota, Colombia. And without her love, without her support, without her caring, this show would not exist because I came to her with my crazy dream of having a TV show uh, six years ago. And she believed in that crazy dream, and that's why we're here. You need to find people who believe in your dreams, folks, and work together. And the power of love is, is really is really real, okay? I know it. So thank you, Claudia. And thank you all for...